throughout this series, we have strove to take land from object that we act upon to subject that we actually have to dialogue with. From something to be consumed to actual full beingness that speaks to critiques and calls us into a better way to live. In this, Carl moved us from Romans 8 where it says that the lands cry out for new creation, that the land lives in anxious anticipation for the children of God to take their true vocation, to caretake, to restore, and to rebuild in such a way that the land can rejoice and find rest. Moved us into the book of Revelation to where the land stands in final judgment as something that bears witness against us that says we are judged by the ways that we have oppressed and consumed, that the land in, in Romans, which is calling for liberation, becomes a witness against us at the end of days, saying these are the ways that they participated in the oppression of us. Which moves into Megan's account of the land absorbing our violence, of having a mouth that swallows, and bears witness to our overreaching grasp to take more than necessary. And that too is a way that land speaks to us and tries to bring us back into a life-sustaining way of being. And finally, there was my uh, part of it in which I highlighted that all of these ways that, that we deal with land, from the co-creative aspect to seeing it as object, that all the ways is part of our construction, and that we measure construction, we measure the value of our construction by its impact on the life of the beings around us, by its impact and its requirements on the land. And this is one of the ways that we start moving towards new creation, by having new constructions that give us a more enduring and blessed way to exist. Now, what happens when the land is cursed, when all of creation is cursed because of humanity? The land cries out desperately for liberation. In the first message of this conversation series, I walked through the opening narrative of Genesis, Isaiah 24, and landed in Romans 8 in order to show how the land was crying out under the suffering it had endured at the hands of humanity. James Cone introduced us to the phrase, God of the oppressed, and the concept that God always aligns with the oppressed. In Revelation 18, it tells us that God's wrath is coming forth for those who destroy the earth. It will destroy those who destroy the earth, which means that we may find ourselves facing God's wrath for the ways that we have treated the earth, the way that we have treated the land. We are accountable for the ways that we either harm or heal the land. And this is a part of end times theology that I was never taught but it is ever present in the Bible when you read the text centering on the land as a character first. In Glenn's message, we find ourselves wrestling with how our constructive perspectives of creation lead us on pathways of, of harming and hoarding the land and also harming others, or it could lead us on a pathway that sees us co-creating with the land and working towards a future of creation, all of it, that flourishes in the wisdom of the honorable harvest. Last, Megan walked us through the story of Cain's murder of his brother Abel and the land's response to this violence. One of the inherent consequences of humanity's violence towards the land and each other is a disconnect from the land that leaves us uncertain of who we are. To know where we are helps us to know who we are. Also, I can never again read the prophet Nathan's parable of the man who steals the sheep from the poor man, disconnected from colonization and creation care. In Carl's first message, we travel through Genesis, Isaiah, and Romans to learn about the ways humanity has broken covenant with both God and the land. He reminds us that as children of God, it is our sacred vocation to care for the land as it takes care of us. But as the land suffers, it cries out in eager expectation, hoping for liberation both from us and for us. The land hopes alongside us for freedom and reminds us that God is on the side of the oppressed. 
In his second message, Carl takes us from Genesis to Revelation and helps us journey through the baggage of theologically triggering words, such as wrath, to realize the justice behind God's rage against systems of oppression, including that of the land. As a result, our eschatological beliefs of accountability, or how God may hold us all to account for what we have done, will include the question of what we have done to the land. Creation care then becomes an important way we work out and live out our understanding of salvation. In Glenn's message, we are also reminded of the constructed nature of our views and relationship to the land. As much as there are good and liberating things that we can learn from creation, um, there are also destructive truths as we all have the power to prescribe and create meaning. In the same way we can use our views of the land to care for each other, we can also use the land to justify harmful and dehumanizing views that hurt others, such as views of superiority and domination. Glenn reminds us that nature communicates but has no real voice of its own. We give it voice informed by the beliefs that we construct with one another. We must be trained to both listen to creation's voice and how to interpret it in a way that allows all that is living to thrive. Lastly, in my message, I encourage us to have a theology that starts with the land. Looking at the curse of Adam and came to the land, we can see that the land suffers our abuse and spits us out when we pollute it with our self-interest and violence. When we have enough, yet still want more, we break our connection to the land. This cycle will continue to lead us to more cycles of violence, exile, and uprootedness. In order to break this cycle of uprootedness, we need to do the work of making the land sacred again, not something we can take and possess. We must decolonize our systems and beliefs, repairing the ways we have ignored that violence to land is violence to all generations. The land teaches us that we are not separate from each other even from the generations behind and before us. I hope this series was helpful in pushing, pushing each of us to reflect and evaluate our theologies, beliefs, and relationship to land as a community of faith. Looking forward to reflecting more together. Thank you. <laughs>